George Bush is very convincing that he saw the first plane strike the World Trade Center the morning of 9-11 on regular TV. He provides supporting details, has repeated the story, and never retracted it. It has run on the White House website. According to the official White House version, it was at this moment in a Florida classroom that Bush learned the second plane had hit the World Trade Center and that the U.S. was under attack. But here's what George Bush himself said almost three months later when asked about September 11. Well, Jordan, you're not going to believe where, what state I was in when I heard about the terrorist attack. I was in Florida. And uh, my chief of staff, Andy Card, well, actually I was in a classroom talking about a reading program that works. And uh, it, uh, I had, was sitting outside uh, the, the, the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower of a, of a TV, you know, the TV was obviously on. I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And uh, I said, it must have been a, a horrible accident. But I was whisked off there. I didn't have much time to think about it. Could George Bush have seen on ordinary TV the first plane hit the World Trade Center? No, he could not have. The footage of that first strike only shows up on television the next day, September the 12th, 2001. It was taken by a French documentary crew that happened to be in downtown New York. It can be suggested Bush confuses the second plane with the first. But how to explain this? We've all seen Andy Carr do that. None of this can ever be retracted. It is an interlocking historical record. Why go on at length about this? Because it may one day become the basis for criminal court proceedings. Describe the design of planned attacks on buildings inside the U.S. and how operatives were directed to carry them out. That is valuable information for those of us who have the responsibility to protect the American people. He told us the operatives have been instructed to ensure that the explosives went off at a, high po a point that was high enough to prevent people trapped above from escaping. He told us the operatives had been instructed to ensure that the explosives went off at a, high po a point that was high enough to prevent people trapped above from escaping. To ensure that the explosives went off at the explosives went off. I know you said there'll be a time for politics, but you've also said you wanted to change the tone of Washington. Howard Dean recently seemed to muse aloud whether you had advanced knowledge of 9-11. Do you agree or disagree with the RNC that this kind of rhetoric borders on political hate speech? Yeah. Uh, look, there's time for politics. And, uh, you know, it's time for politics. And uh, I, uh, it's an absurd insinuation. In that case, sir, can I follow up on something unrelated? In 2001, after the World Trade Center bombing, my detachment was alerted to deploy to Afghanistan to conduct unconventional warfare operations. In 2001, after the World Trade Center bombing, in 2001, after the World Trade Center bombing, have a sense if we imagine the kind of world we would face if the people who bombed the best hall in Mosul, or the people who did the bombing in Spain, or the people who attacked the United States in New York, shot down the plane over Pennsylvania, and attacked the Pentagon, shot down the plane over Pennsylvania, shot down the plane over Pennsylvania. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. 
uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. Outrageous. Simply outrageous. It takes months of preparation and planning to do a controlled demolition like this one. They had to have put these charges in place before September 11th. Larry Silverstein was kind enough to tell us that they demolished this building on September 11th. But who was they? And are we supposed to think that they didn't have explosive charges in place in the Twin Towers? Uh, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center complex, Larry Silverstein, gave a uh, public interview on PBS in 2002, and he said that they pulled that building, which is a demolition term for intentionally bringing down a building. This man made over $5 billion from those buildings' destruction, and I want to know if there was ever a formal investigation into Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center complex, and his ties to this entire event. I don't believe there's been a formal investigation. I haven't heard that. I don't know that. I do know that uh, they, that, that wall, I remember, was, was in danger, and I think that they made a decision based on the danger that it had of destroying other things, that they did it in a controlled fashion. If the official story is true, and an astoundingly successful sneak attack from diabolical Muslims caught America totally off guard, then the White House surely must be highly motivated to turn heaven and earth, to use one of their own favorite cliches, to investigate the events of that day as quickly and thoroughly as possible. The White House must rush to appoint a respected chairman and commissioners, give them the widest powers to call witnesses, spare no expense. Except for the rice tag fire, that's how it's usually done. Six days after the sinking of the Titanic, a chairman is appointed to head an investigation. Nine days after Pearl Harbor, the first of four investigative commissions is struck. The JFK assassination, the Challenger disaster, seven days each. How many days after 9-11 is it that President Bush names session. someone to head an investigation? This commission has been charged with a crucial task. Call it foot dragging. The White House chooses all the commissioners, key insiders rife with conflicts of interest. The editor of Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter, sums it up. The Bush White House did everything in its power to derail an open inquiry. Then, when faced with its inevitability, the president and his aides sought to limit its scope, its access, and its funding. This commission was about as independent from White House control and manipulation as the abused prisoners at Abu Ghraib were from their jailers. Mandate. The commission itself says, we're not out to blame anyone. In other words, accountability is not part of the mandate. Budget. In January 2003, the Bush administration allots the commission $3 million. This compares to $5 million for a 1996 commission that looked into casino gambling and $50 million each for the inquiries into the Columbia shuttle explosion and the Clinton's failed Whitewater deal. The dollar amount is later grudgingly raised but never exceeds $15 million. The White House releases only 25% of 11,000 documents requested. It blacks out portions of the release documents, resists requests that the administration officials testify under oath, and tries to rush the commission's deadline. After a cat and mouse game, Bush and Cheney meet the commission. But it is behind closed doors. They refuse to testify under oath. No tape recorders are allowed. No transcript is allowed. Bush makes no opening statement, and those taking notes must submit them to security personnel. All of this is what is called in law guilty demeanor. The behavior of the White House in relation to the Commission from start to finish only makes sense if the official story is a lie and the truth needs to be kept secret.